Good morning. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 15th day in the month of August 2023. You're welcome to Business Morning. This is where you get 55 minutes of current and relevant business conversations. I'm Amy John Rekwa. We're doing this together. We are here for 55 minutes with you. And we start off with what's going on in the grain space globally. Chicago corn and soy bean features slid on Tuesday after weekly reports from the U.S. government showed better than expected conditions for both crops. Wheat fell for a third consecutive session on increasing estimate for Russia's production and exports. The most active soybean contract on the Chicago Board of Trade lost 0.2% to $13.23 for three quarter of a bushel. And corn fell 0.7% to $4.84 a bushel for half a bushel. Wheat gave up 0.2% to $6.15 and that's for a bushel. Weekly conditions ratings for the U.S. soybean bean and corn crops improved in the past week, more than analysts expected, and that's according to the United States government data, which had expected an improvement of 1% point. In the edible oil space, uh, palm oil features jumped more than 3% to uh, set a end a three-session decline on a weekly rigid improving exports and strength in rival edible oils. The benchmark palm oil contracts for October delivery on the Bossa Malaysia Derivatives Exchange was up 115 rigid uh, to, or oh, that's about 3.11% to 3,809 rigid uh, estimated at $823 per metric ton. The market is seeing an upside correction after a few days of lackluster trading that caused a widening of the price spread between bean oil and palm oil. India's palm oil imports in July jumped 59% from the previous month to 1.08 million metric tons, and that's the highest in seven months as refiners took advantage of lower prices to increase purchases. Crude oil now prices edge high on Tuesday as China unexpectedly cut key policy rates for the second time in three months to shore up a sputtering economic recovery, although sluggish economic out of Beijing puts a lid on gains. Brent crude features rose 32 cents to trade at 86 cents, 86 dollars 53 cents per barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude was up 26 cents to 82 dollars 77 cents a barrel. Prices turned higher after the People's Bank of China lowered the rate on 401 billion yuan, which is about 55.3 billion. Uh, uh, dollars in one year medium term lending facility loans to some financial institutions by 15 basis points to 2.5 percent China's uh, industrial output and retail sales data on Tuesday captured all of this. And here in Nigeria, perhaps Nigerians can sigh a little bit of relief uh, after the NNPCL retail arm has said that they have no intention to increase their pump price. And they're asking Nigerians to buy quality products at the most affordable prices at their retail stations, which are nationwide. And this statement, of course, follows uh, alleged reports that there will be yet another hike in the price of petrol following the recent fall in the value of Naira. And I'm sure you have seen some filling stations locked up and queues are already forming up. Well, NNPCL, uh, the retail arm, is saying they have no intention of increasing price. And of course, we had Labour yesterday follow up on that and threaten a shutdown if uh, the federal government does not intervene and if there's another hike in the price of petrol. Have you ever attended a Naira conference? We certainly need it now when the Naira seems to be not doing so good. The collapse of Nigeria's multiple official exchange rate into a single rate by the Central Bank of Nigeria might have received applause by many, but stakeholders are with policies and institutional reforms that will stimulate foreign currency inflows and attract foreign direct and portfolio investments. These form the backdrop 
of conversations at the Naira conference, which was in, in Lagos at the event. Players in the financial services sector and policy experts offer their thoughts on how these reforms could be consolidated to achieve set objectives. The second edition of the Naira conference is conveyed to chart pathways for monetary policy reform and strategize for sustained economic growth. So government policy is like the an interactive session with the guest speaker emphasizes the necessity of a balanced approach in the context of understanding the relationship between exchange rate policies and international trade. We must put trade at the front as of the of the foreign exchange regime. Going forward, the conference features a technical panel and interactive sessions of prominent economists and other experts who delve into crucial macroeconomic subjects, setting the stage for deeper discussions of the role and consequences of foreign exchange policy on various stakeholders. Correcting price itself is a very superficial intervention. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We don't have the right as, as fintech to trade in forex. And the bank, commercial bank today, they are the major dealer of, of this transaction. If they can liberalize it, allow those of us who have contacts, we have wallets, where those transactions can be terminated into, I think it will help more. And also bring in the bureau the change into the scope of distribution to help ease this entire process that we are seeing. In one of several notable proposals, Mr. Mr. Ola Oyetayo, founder and CEO of Veto, advocates the licensing of fintechs and non-bank financial institutions as authorized dealers in the foreign exchange market. In terms of infrastructure, uh, if we can just have this uh, you know, regulatory policy where there's no concept of authorized dealers and the only authorized dealers are commercial banks, where you can actually have maybe a financial uh, a foreign exchange license uh, and then you need to have certain criteria to be met before you can um, get that license and that license then allows you to participate um, you know, in buying and selling FX in country, uh, it would go a very long way to creating the enabling um, sort of payment infrastructure we require. A resounding call for transparency echoes throughout the conference as participants underscore that transparency from the central bank and government will cultivate market confidence and stimulate investment. The 2023 Naira conference was co-organized by Arbitez Media and Wole Famurewa with supports from a wide range of stakeholders, including the Financial Markets Dealers Association, the Nigeria Export Imports Bank and several corporate sponsors. The Naira is certainly in the news, remains in the news uh, for now. And also, the regulator obviously follows suit. For the first time since 2015, the Central Bank of Nigeria made its book available for public scrutiny, and that's what we're going to do next. Well, the release consolidated financial statements uh, for 2016, 2017, 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22. We have some highlights there, which is what we're going to focus on. Uh, of course, the first is that uh, the CBN declared profit after tax of uh, 103. That's for the group in 2022, and it's about 65. Uh, that's for the group, but for the bank in 2022 was about 65 billion. We have um, someone who is very close and uh, analytical when it comes to the CBN. Kelvin Emanuel, financial analyst, joins us from our Abuja studio. Hi, Mr. Emanuel, thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Nigerians are not tired of talking about this statement. You know, unexpectedly, we saw it after seven years. And uh, some, of course, highlights of it have been catching attention. Uh, I know you've gone through it several times. What are some of the high points for you from that uh, financial statement? Uh, well, I, I have to tell you first that um, if you look at that consolidated report, you'll find that in 2022, the CBN allocated 701 million naira for audits. There was no audit in 2022. In 2021, it allocated 673 million naira for audits. There was no audit in 2021. Sections 51 and 3 of the CBN Act 2007 says that every year, the Central Bank of Nigeria is subject to an external audit and that audit is supposed to be presented to the Nigerian Senate, sections 51, 
And Section 53 says that after it's been presented to the Nigerian Senate, that it's supposed to be gazetted to the public. That has not been done in several years, which is a violation of the CBN Act. Okay? Now, if you look at the highlights of um, the consolidated statement, you will discover that the CBN was lucky to get net assets grow. And net assets grew because it gave out loans to the federal government, classified as ways and means, in violation of Section 38, 23.7 trillion. When the MFLA took over from um, Mr. Sanusi and then Sarah Alata, um, Alade, who was like a, an interim CEO of the CBN between Sanusi's exit and his emergence, Ways and Means was 869 billion naira. MFLA grew Ways and Means to 23.7 trillion. Between 2019 and 2022, MFLA advanced the federal government 15.3 trillion naira. And how did he achieve this? He raised the cash reserve ratio of Nigerian banks from 15%, which was where he met it, he raised it to 32.5%, took the monies from the banks. So between 2014, when TSA was um, um, introduced, public sector CRR that was somewhere around 75%. Public sector accounts in banks was collapsed into TSA. So there was no more public sector CRR. CRR cash reserve ratio is basically like a tool that the Central Bank of Nigeria uses to mop up liquidity from the system to reduce supply of money and regulate inflation. MFLA twisted it, took that liquidity from the banking system, gave to the federal government, it cost inflation, and if you look at the report, you see that net assets grew to 2.3 trillion naira. And that was how they were able to survive the fact that they didn't go into insolvency from spending 888 billion naira in all kinds of expenses. Like 127 billion naira in administrative expenses for 365 days work. 127 billion naira for 365 days of work. The Central Bank of Nigeria spent 127 billion naira as expenses for 365 days of work. They spent 15.5 billion naira for repairs and maintenance. They declared 875 billion naira in credit losses, credit losses to bad loans because the Accounting model that was used to audit the CBN by KPMG and Ernst and Young is IFRS 9. And in IFRS 9, they are obligated to do what they call loan loss provisioning and not to carry the loss to another financial year. So they basically like provided for the loss on the balance sheet. And 875 billion naira from bad loans, like for example, the Anchor Borrowers program of 1.4 trillion naira that was given, that has a less than 30% collection rates was declared um, to on, on the balance sheet. Yeah, so, and you know, for example, yeah, it, you know, it's important. It, yeah, and you know, remember about that Anchor Boras program um, when the assessment was done, I think it was by an, one of the international institutions, uh, that the, the rate of repayment, I remember the CBN did come to say that that wasn't true. And now I think it shows in, in their books. It shows in the books because the auditor statement does not lie. The Central Bank of Nigeria spent 265 billion naira on salaries, wages, allowance, and pension benefits for their staffs. Right? Also, what is more troubling, if you look at the balance sheet, you see that 1.5 trillion, 1.4 trillion naira was declared as net interest expense. Now, what is net interest expense? That's expenses that they pay for securities and loans that the CBN is carrying on their books, which shows, for example, that the Central Bank of Nigeria had gone ahead to take $7.5 billion from two U.S. banks, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, who happened to be ex external asset managers to the CBN. They took those loans in what they call a repo transaction, carried it over on the books, is accumulating 9.2% of interest per annum, and they pledged Nigeria's foreign reserves, which is what you use for your balance of payments, as a collateral. So if, for example, G Goldman and JP Morgan, they work by IFRS 9 in their own external audit too, for example, they decide to call in the loans 
and the CBN is not able to pay the interest, decided to call in the loans, they will have to liquidate Nigeria's balance of payments, a section of it, which has become encumbered, to be able to pay that facility. So is that where the so reserves come in, Kelvin? Net, net? Is, that, is that where the reserve? Because a lot of people have been worried. I think uh, right now the number we have for our reserve about 33 billion and people are doubting that. Is that where if this JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, if they were to, you know, really go for it, that will really bring down our reserve? Is there a connection there? It will bring down our reserves and it's a threat to national security because if your balance of payments drop, there is what they call a Guidotti Greenspan rule, and I've said this a few times in central banking, that says your external debt, which currently stands at 43 billion US dollars, must always be equal to your balance of payments or foreign reserves. It's called the ratio of reserves to external debt ratio. For one year, Nigeria's external debt nets, considering that you have $6.8 billion in forwards that the central bank is supposed to pay. You have $7.5 billion in loans. Nigeria's ex um, foreign reserves currently stands at somewhere around $18 billion. As against the figure that the central bank had claimed three weeks ago was $33.6 billion. That is, that is a, a crisis. That is a, a, a cause for concern, a, a grave cause for concern for every well-meaning Nigerian. And it also contributes to the fact that despite the reforms, despite the devaluation and attempted unification of the Naira, despite the introduction of the non-deliverable forwards that have seen market players and companies convert their mature letters of credit, capital and dividend remittances from A's into forwards that the CBN is owing a total of $6.8 billion, despite the fact that ratings agencies have placed Nigeria, reviewed the outlook from negative to stable, and there's been wide um, you know, acclamation. The CBN has allowed the Nigerian Treasury bill yields to float, to align with convexity in that inflation to interest yield curve. You've not seen inflow of FX into Nigeria from foreign portfolio investors and non-speculative foreign direct investors because they know the numbers. Mm. So I don't Why will the company, for example, an institutional investor want to bring $5 billion into Nigeria when he knows that the CBN's balance of payment is $18 billion. So, and it's so, owing forwards of $6.8 billion it has not paid. And it's owing two U.S. banks um, $7.5 billion. Why so, would they want to bring their investment? So, Kelvin, I don't know if you heard the acting governor yesterday. He did promise that there's an intervention coming to the FX space. And, uh, I mean, you and I know that what we really need in that FX space is, is supply. I don't know if there's another way. I mean, you, you, you are an expert there. What are the other ways? What kind of intervention can help us at this time when the Naira is just losing its value? Well, to be honest with you, um, there is practically no way, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how the president is going to convince institutional investors, personally convince them and give them guarantees to bring in FX. But I have looked at this problem. Despite the fact that we need wide, short and medium term institutional reforms, like a whole overhaul of the CBN Act and the current chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking, Insurance, and Financial Services used to be the MD of a bank. He's the current chairman, so I, I expect that he understands banking and central banking very well. Okay? The short-term treaties that the government can focus on is intra-central bank lending. Nigeria can tap its so, uh, special drawing rights at the IMF. Now that the IMF understands the real position of Nigeria's balance of payments and the real position of the books of the central bank, you can tap the SDRU units, and pledge it at what they call the terms of auction facility window at the US Federal Reserve. There is international precedence to back it. The Bank of Japan used it. So the Swiss National Bank used it. Even the European Central Bank used it between 2008 and 2012 to create like a six to 12 month short term um, 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 loan that it will use to shock the market in Nigeria. The rates are better than the rates that it's getting from JP Morgan and Goldman at 9.2% per annum. The rates on intra-central bank lending at that terms of auction is actually below the federal funds rates, which is somewhere anything from 3% to 4 p.m., 3.5% per annum. It can use that window to shock because it needs to first clear the forwards of $6.8 billion that it's owing for you to incentivize 
FPIs and FDIs to bring dollars into Nigeria. And for you to create like a psychological, remove the psychological barrier that is instigating a lot of people in panic buying to migrate to the US dollar and fuel the speculation that you're seeing in the foreign exchange market and that has created a black market premium of 18%. That is a short-term solution you can use. On the longer term, on the longer term, it needs to improve its fiscals. Its fiscals being, it needs to improve its output on crude oil exports. It needs to build more NLNG train stations. In the last financial year report that was released by NLNG, NLNG paid only $1.1 billion. In 2012, NLNG did about $11.5 billion and paid about $2.9 billion in dividends to the NNPC that holds the FG's 49% as a government-owned enterprise. Those are long-term solutions, adding train 7, train 8, train 9, train 10 to increase Nigeria's annual output of LNG from 22 million metric tons to anywhere around 50 million metric tons. Those are five, seven years. You can't do anything about it right now. On the issue of increasing crude oil production, it will take some time for Nigeria to get to 2 million barrels or 2.5 million barrels. It also needs to be able to fight, for, fight with OPEC to, to increase its quota as it increases output and export um, capacity. Raised it to 32.5%, took the monies from the banks. So between 2014, when TSA was um, um, introduced, public sector CRR that was somewhere around 75%. Public sector accounts in banks was collapsed into TSA. So there was no more public sector CRR. CRR cash reserve ratio is basically like a tool that the Central Bank of Nigeria uses to mop up liquidity from the system to reduce supply of money and regulate inflation. MFLA twisted it, took that liquidity from the banking system, gave to the federal government, it cost inflation. And if you look at the report, you see that net assets grew to 2.3 trillion naira. And that was how they were able to survive the fact that they didn't go into insolvency from spending 888 billion naira in all kinds of expenses, like 127 billion naira in administrative expenses for 365 days work, 127 billion naira for 307. 65 days of work. The Central Bank of Nigeria spent 127 billion naira as expenses for 365 days of work. They spent 15.5 billion naira for repairs and maintenance. They declared 875 billion naira in credit losses, credit losses to bad loans, because the accounting model that was used to audit the CBN by KPMG and Ernst and Young is IFRS 9. And in IFRS 9, they are obligated to do what they call loan loss provisioning and not to carry the loss to another financial year. So they basically like provided for the loss on the balance sheet and 875 billion naira from bad loans like for example the Anchor Borrowers program of 1.4 trillion naira that was given that has a less than 30% collection rates was declared um, to on, on the balance sheet. Yeah, so, and you know, for example, yeah, you it, know, it's important it, yeah, and you know, remember about that Anchor Boras program um, when the assessment was done, I think it was by an, one of the international institutions, uh, that the, the rate of repayment, I remember the CBN did come to say that that wasn't true. And now I think it shows in, in their books. It shows in the books because the auditor statement does not lie. The Central Bank of Nigeria spent 265 billion naira on salaries, wages, allowance, a pension benefits for their staffs, right? Also, what is more troubling, if you look at the balance sheet, you see that 1.5 trillion, 1.4 trillion naira was declared as net interest expense. Now, what is net interest expense? That's expenses that they pay for securities and loans that the CBN is carrying on their books, which shows, for example, that the Central Bank of Nigeria had gone ahead to take seven and a half billion dollars from two US banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, who happened to be ex external asset managers to the CBN. They took those loans in what they call a repo transaction, carried it over on the books, is accumulating 9.2% of interest per annum, and they pledged Nigeria's foreign reserves, which is what you use for your balance of payments, as a collateral. So if, for example, G Goldman and JP Morgan they work by IFRS 9 in their own external audit too, for example. They decide to call in the loans 
and the CBN is not able to pay the interest, decided to call in the loans, they will have to liquidate Nigeria's balance of payments, a section of it, which has become encumbered, to be able to pay that facility. So is that where the so reserves come in, Kelvin? Net, net? Is, that, is that where the reserve? Because a lot of people have been worried. I think uh, right now the number we have for our reserve about 33 billion and people are doubting that. Is that where if this JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, if they were to, you know, really go for it, that will really bring down our reserve? Is there a connection there? It will bring down our reserves and it's a threat to national security because if your balance of payments drop, there is what they call a Guidotti Greenspan rule, and I've said this a few times in central banking, that says your external debt, which currently stands at 43 billion US dollars, must always be equal to your balance of payments or foreign reserves. It's called the ratio of reserves to external debt ratio. For one year, Nigeria's external debt nets, considering that you have $6.8 billion in forwards that the central bank is supposed to pay. You have $7.5 billion in loans. Nigeria's ex um, foreign reserves currently stands at somewhere around $18 billion. As against the figure that the central bank had claimed three weeks ago was $33.6 billion. That is, that is a, a crisis. That is a, a, a cause for concern, a, a grave cause for concern for every well-meaning Nigerian. And it also contributes to the fact that despite the reforms, despite the devaluation and attempted unification of the Naira, despite the introduction of the non-deliverable forwards that have seen market players and companies convert their mature letters of credit, capital and dividend remittances from A's into forwards that the CBN is owing a total of $6.8 billion, despite the fact that ratings agencies have placed Nigeria, reviewed the outlook from negative to stable, and there's been wide um, you know, acclamation. The CBN has allowed the Nigerian Treasury bill yields to float, to align with convexity in that inflation to interest yield curve. You've not seen inflow of FX into Nigeria from foreign portfolio investors and non-speculative foreign direct investors because they know the numbers. Mm. So I don't Why will the company, for example, an institutional investor want to bring $5 billion into Nigeria when he knows that the CBN's balance of payment is $18 billion. So, and it's so, owing forwards of $6.8 billion it has not paid. And it's owing two U.S. banks um, $7.5 billion. Why so, would they want to bring their investment? So, Kelvin, I don't know if you heard the acting governor yesterday. He did promise that there's an intervention coming to the FX space. And, uh, I mean, you and I know that what we really need in that FX space is, is supply. I don't know if there's another way. I mean, you, you, you are an expert there. What are the other ways? What kind of intervention can help us at this time when the Naira is just losing its value? Well, to be honest with you, um, there is practically no way, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how the president is going to convince institutional investors, personally convince them and give them guarantees to bring in FX. But I have looked at this problem. Despite the fact that we need wide, short and medium term institutional reforms, like a whole overhaul of the CBN Act and the current chairman of the Senate's Committee on Banking, Insurance, and Financial Services used to be the MD of a bank. He's the current chairman, so I, I expect that he understands banking and central banking very well. Okay? The short-term treaties that the government can focus on is intra-central bank lending. Nigeria can tap its so, uh, special drawing rights at the IMF. Now that the IMF understands the real position of Nigeria's balance of payments and the real position of the books of the central bank, you can tap the SDRU units, and pledge it at what they call the terms of auction facility window at the US Federal Reserve. There is international precedence to back it. The Bank of Japan used it. So the Swiss National Bank used it. Even the European Central Bank used it between 2008 and 2012 to create like a six to 12 month short term um, 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 loan that it will use to shock the market in Nigeria. The rates are better than the rates that it's getting from JP Morgan and Goldman at 9.2% per annum. The rates on intra-central bank lending at that terms of auction is actually below the federal funds rates, which is somewhere anything from 3% to 4 p.m., 3.5% per annum. It can use that window to shock because it needs to first clear the forwards of $6.8 billion that it's owing for you to incentivize 
FPIs and FDIs to bring dollars into Nigeria. And for you to create like a psychological, remove the psychological barrier that is instigating a lot of people in panic buying to migrate to the US dollar and fuel the speculation that you're seeing in the foreign exchange market and that has created a black market premium of 18%. That is a short-term solution you can use. On the longer term, on the longer term, it needs to improve its fiscals. Its fiscals being, it needs to improve its output on crude oil exports. It needs to build more NLNG train stations. In the last financial year report that was released by NLNG, NLNG paid only $1.1 billion. In 2012, NLNG did about $11.5 billion and paid about $2.9 billion in dividends to the NNPC that holds the FG's 49% as a government-owned enterprise. Those are long-term solutions, adding train 7, train 8, train 9, train 10 to increase Nigeria's annual output of LNG from 22 million metric tons to anywhere around 50 million metric tons. Those are five, seven years. You can't do anything about it right now. On the issue of increasing crude oil production, it will take some time for Nigeria to get to 2 million barrels or 2.5 million barrels. It also needs to be able to fight, for, fight with OPEC to, to increase its quota as it increases output and export um, capacity. Because OPEC's forward guidance for the next two years says that they are going to continue to cut production and stabilize it to ensure that crude oil prices stays anywhere between 95 and $100 per barrel, considering yeah, but, that the U.S. government yeah. is going to use its strategic yeah, reserve but, but, uh, I mean, to fight the, any increase in crude oil prices. The thing with that is we are not even able to meet up with our quota at this time, so asking for more is, is even far from it. Before we let you go, Kelvin, let's do this for our viewers. Some of our viewers have said, uh, they reached out to say that they have a problem with their um, account numbers. So it seems that an account number exists in different banks. The same account number exists in this bank. Same number exists in another bank. And that has led to a situation where some individuals will send funds to the wrong bank because it is the same account number. I don't know what you know about this and what customers, what rights customers have in retrieving their funds in things like this. Well, to be honest with you, um, this is why the banks always um, encourage that before customers make transfer, they check and confirm the account numbers thoroughly because the process of retrieving monies that are sent to a wrong account are very tedious. The bank does not have the legal authority to retrieve money that was sent to a wrong account without a court order, right? So if the, the, what you have under the new bank banking system is a, a system where you have just a difference of one or two or three digits under the 10 digit numbering system. But what I about when the number that, is the um, same? It's like a when the problem number... of a mismatch or mistake. No, when the uh, number. From the central bank. Yeah, the that, number is the same. When they designed the new bank banking system. I don't think it's from, it's from there. When the number is the same, the number in this bank is the same number with the other banks, same number, different banks. Should it, even, should it be like well, that? I, I, no, I, I, I doubt there is a situation where there are exactly identical numbers for all 10 digits between a customer in bank A and a customer in bank B because the BVN, bank verification number, that guides the accounts of customers in all banks, yeah, creates a unique identification number for that new bank for customers in different banks. So you might have just a difference of maybe one or two digits and people make mistakes when they are going to make transfers. The process, however, is prevent, this, this is a situation of prevention is better than cure because if you don't double check and cross check and ensure that it's the right account you're sending the money to, the process of retrieving the monies from the customer who might have spent it without reporting to the bank is very tedious. All right, Kelvin, but I assure you it's the same number, the same number. But it's fine. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Kelvin Emanuel, financial analyst, uh, for joining us. And, of course, that's uh, expose and uh, eye on the financial statement. Very useful. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me.
All right, now let's take a break. When we come back, it will be commodities time. And today we'll be discussing the consumer goods sector or industry. See what's happening there. Do join us after the break. back to watching business morning here on channels television talking about financial statements it's not the cbn only that has shared it we've seen from uh, a lot of listed companies and uh, we're going to look a little bit at the consumers goods sector some of the companies there or one of the companies there actually but i mean we'll do an overview at that industry and what one thing that note that we noticed in uh, most of the statements released is the factor the fx factor and what it has done to its profits and its operating uh, uh, revenue or operating costs. So we have to discuss this with us, so Mr. Ravindra Singhvi. Mr. Ravindra Singhvi is the Chief Executive Officer of Dangote Sugar Refinery, PLC, joins us virtually from Lagos. Good morning, Mr. Singhvi. Good morning. So uh, we've seen a lot of statements uh, from Dangote and some others. Uh, tell, tell us from your perspective the impact of this FX policy. We saw that it changed the face of some of those statements. How is it affecting Dangote? How are you treating it in Dangote? Yeah, thank you for uh, raising this very important and burning issue. As such, the Dangote sugar has performed very well. Our top line has increased by 9.3 percent and to 202 billion, and our gross profit has also improved significantly over uh, previous year to 58 billion and about 28.7 percent. But unfortunately, the forex has uh, eaten out, taken out all the sheen uh, from the good performance. Uh, we have reported 85 billion as the financial charges and forex loss. Uh, during the last six months up to 30th June. Uh, the main problem is the uh, falling of the Naira and we had to take the provision in our books accordingly. Because the policy change, unification of the currency has been announced by the government and because of which uh, we had taken it all. Earlier we used to get the Naira, uh, used to get the dollar from the CBN uh, from its portal at 465 and now we have to do at the parallel market rate which has been recently announced by the government. So it has really impacted uh, adversely the performance of uh, the sugar uh, refinery. And we are, we are working towards it. We have to make the provisions in the books uh, month on month to ensure that we reflect the correct uh, financials in our books. So uh, we, the, the, the headwinds are really there and we have to be very careful in our provisioning norms to be very prudent and to ensure that uh, we have the uh, correct reflection of our uh, financial statements. And uh, in spite of this, you're planning a merger. You're supposed to merge your Dangote Rice uh, with NASCON. Is this going to help? Definitely it is going to help. You know, the DSR is the number one player in Nigerian sugar market, and NASCON also controls the salt market in a significant manner. Right? Both the companies are delivering already impressive uh, growth trajectory over the last three years. Right? And individual businesses, this, this inherent strength of these individual uh, businesses, uh, coupled with a mutually exclusive yet complementary nature of the products of the three companies, among other factors, a is a compelling case for business unification. Uh, I, we see a lot of value uh, in the share, shareholders value creation. It will offer expanded product offering uh, with a diversified revenue base, a potential for uh, improved geographical uh, spread and route to market strategies. It has enhanced operational efficiencies. It will create a stronger business case for access to capital amongst others. Besides, it will improve the supply side of the food. Today, there is a very big gap in the food. 
foods we are importing, we are importing rice, we are importing raw sugar, we are importing uh, raw salt also. Now, the Dangote's focus is to have a focus on the backward integration. As you already know that Dangote is uh, pitching very big in the, in the BIPs. We already have one BIP operating at a good level and a lot of expansions are going in these BIPs. We are coming out with an uh, investment in Nasrava also, where we are put, putting up the backward integration project. Similarly, the Dangotes have big plans for uh, in the rice sector. Already our few plants are there, where we are starting our new plants from December 2023. So with this, I mean, creating a very strong food outfit, Dangote will be able to bridge the gap between the uh, import and the uh, uh, self-sufficiency of the uh, of, of the federal uh, of the country. So I see the food is a very big uh, important item where we'll be able to help uh, mitigating the inflationary trends which we are seeing today. 24% is the inflation, and with the self-sufficiency, with the improvement in the BIP, I'm sure in the medium to long term it will help the uh, consumers a lot. It will uh, it will save the foreign exchange and also it will generate a very good uh, revenue to the revenue stream to the farmers uh, which are uh, uh, deprived section as of now uh, we have our plans to improve our outgrowers reach we are already doing in our sugar refinery through the outgrowers we have a plan to improve the business to the outgrowers besides our own land which is very significant in the sugar refinery we have about 108,000 8, hectares of land, out of which we have already uh, done the uh, cane development in uh, uh, in 15,000 hectares as of now. And our plans are that in next five years we reach to a significant level to improve our uh, uh, and contribution to the self-sufficiency of the sugar as well as uh, the rice and other products. All right, uh, certainly the consumers will be waiting, you know, to see when you can actually help reduce that import and the pressure on Naira when it comes to rice and um, sugar. And we hope when you finish producing, you don't export uh, and leave the local consumers down. But thank you so much for your time this morning, Mr. Ravindro Singh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Dangote Sugar Refinery, PLC. Thank you. We'll take a breather now. When we come back, we'll head to the markets. Commodities uh, space, so markets to the money market, and Will comes in with the details. Good morning, Nini. Will, good morning. Uh, profit taking continued. Yes, yesterday we just really just interest. bounce off uh, what you were having the conversation you were having with the Dangote gas. Yeah. It was more like FX issues, the pressures of the FX yes. you know, taking a toll on the consumer goods sector. We did yes. see Guinness, we did see uh, Cadbury. All of them, I oh, think. Yes, but if you look at their statement, I was expecting to see it in the CBN statement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you see that they, but I did not say anything. <laughs> you didn't say anything. But you know, yesterday they recovered. You saw so Dangote. I mean, the consumer goods sector. You know, taking up yesterday yes. more than forty. Uh, I four. think was it Dangote again? Yeah, I think you have the boss man. No, no, no. That was Dangote. I think. Yeah, I think Dangote it was sugar. Dangote. Yeah, yeah. Going just up Dangote sugar, sugar. Going yes. up yesterday. So you did see that they are recovering, and investors are bargaining on it and taking advantage of low prices to you know boost those shares in that sector in that segment. So it's yeah. really a good thing for investors. But we need more. FX anyway. Yes, we do need more FX. <laughs> and yesterday, did you see that the markets kind of like closed? We had two closes yesterday. First of all, we yes, had Yes, and then we had the late the trading. Late trading that brought it to Because when I reported the markets yesterday, it was down 0.18%. And, and we then, had that after hours trade, which brought it further down 0.44%. Yeah, it is really a massive I think some market. investors were waiting somewhere just to take some profit. Oh, is this inflation jitters coming and saying, <laughs> oh no, I need to take profit before inflation numbers come up. You know, it's due today. So we did 
see that number coming down for the yesterday's 0.44%, settling still at the 65,000 level, but hanging very close, about to lose that uh, level, and still at the 35 trillion naira mark. And we're seeing sentiment pressures in Bois Cement really brought down the market yesterday. So let's look at the, the sectors. I mean, the activity yesterday, we did see that activity dropping yesterday from what we had on Friday, 259.04 million units traded yesterday, valued at 4.2 billion naira, and all transacted in over 5,800 deals. Let's look at the sectors very quickly. We see banking sector down. The tier one banks, the Fugas were all down yesterday. Consumer goods, you see Dangote Sugar popping that counter up. While cement pulled this counter down, insurance are up. Insurance stocks, I think they're the places to be right now. It's the place to be. Oil and gas also down in yesterday's trading session. But we're bringing in Ambrose Omodion. He's a chief research officer, invest data consultant, to give us more insights. Good morning, Ambrose. Yeah, good morning, Nick. Uh, it's good to have you on the program. Uh, we've seen this, uh, you know, bearish thoughts to the market yesterday. And uh, w what's happening? Is, is Should we continue seeing this or is it just a fluke? And today it's going to close in the green? <laughs> Actually, what is happening is that uh, you no know, designing investors are taking opportunity as markets are uh, coordinating at this point. And at the same time, I believe that uh, what traders should be doing right away is that you take advantage of any rebound to take profit for those that are, you know, investors for medium and long term are taking advantage of the pullback to target those uh, fundamental stand stock to position. And don't forget that when market is consolidating like this, you know, it creates opportunity to buy. But it break out, as we just said, the 65,000 up and get around to 66 before now see a new trend is up. But for me, there's no cause for alarm as far as I'm still on the inflation figure. But if you look at the earnings that came for a uh, half year, it gives an insight where investors is looking at at this point. You no, know, like uh, the program you just had before this one, all the manufacturing sector are really not down because of what they are posting a negative report for for half year. But that gives an insight to investors what to do. In, in any market, whether you are playing fixed income or equity market, there's what we call rotation in your portfolio. Either you call it a balance, and you want to give it. Now that you are equity investor, we are seeing that there are some industries that are doing well. This is what we call a you know, sector rotation. Move to a sector where it's less opportunity. That's why I said, what we are seeing in the market is that all eyes are on the, on the five uh, the five first year bank to lose their result. Once it comes to the market, it will change the dynamics, dynamics of the market. And at the same time, like we just said, inflation is expected today. Why tomorrow, if possible, we are likely to see you no know, assigning of a portfolio or inauguration of a new minister if it comes. And investors see the plans of this minister. Any industry they want to go or, or ministry, bring out their plans, that will guide investors on what to do. Generally, the expert thing is important to the economy, but in that, there's still opportunity to make money in this market. That means investors will design a, a model or in a kind of strategy that they target those companies, even with excess problem, their businesses or their activities will continue to look up so that if they find their third quarter result are from what October that will be hitting the market. That is how to because today is already 15. That means so I've gone half of a uh, third quarter. Then looking at you know, the remaining few uh, days in the, in, the, in the quarter, it's for you to know where will you put your portfolio or put your investment to see that at the end of the day, you maintain an uptrend. For those in the market sector, until uh, CBN and government will to fix that uh, volatility and, and supply dollar, those are the will still be you know, not in their wound. But for you as an investor, mm -hmm. you don't need to stay in, 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 post, in, in, in portfolio or an investment where you know at the end of the day, you won't get what no return. <laughs> then you move your portfolio out to work through. The banking sector was seen today. That's why the, the results I've said earlier from GTP, Zenith Bank, you know, um, and uh, Assets Bank, UBA, and the stamp pick is very, very okay. important. What is okay. that in the market? They want to change the world, the psychology of investors. Knowing that okay. we started to post another FS game, that will change the psychology of investors. Let's look at okay. look to that, that number. Okay. Mr. Ambrose, before, just very quickly, before I let you go, we did see the Chief Financial Officer of the Nigerian Innovation Handling Company, NACO, acquired one million uh, worth of shares. Uh, I mean, one million shares. Uh, is there something, what's driving this? Is there something we should look out for in that service sector? What's fishing? No, I, like, yeah, actually, like, there's something going for service sector in Nigeria. But when you see an uh, you know, CFO or MD or executive director, non-executive, buying into their company. It tells that they have information 
that's likely impact on the on their performance. That's why they are taking an advantage. But when you see a chairman of a company, not executive buying, yeah, it's possible they have information, also they have money. But when you see executive that is any salary from that company, using, using his own hard time money to buy to the company, that means there's something good or something coming at the end of the day. And also if you compare NACO performance with others in the industry, they are already a leader. We are seeing that NACO performance in the last three to five years have been consistent and their dividend growth has also been that direction. For that, it does mean that this company is a good mind for them. And also seeing the one of the directors, one of the decision making nobody. In that company buying, it gives you that there's something happening. Look at what is happening also in Sterling Bank. Seeing the end of Sterling Bank for due to buy and also the executive director, it gives investors that there's something happening. That's why I said investors is not going to realign their portfolio in the service sector where I believe that we are seeing a lot of potential that at the end of the day their performance would impact on their price and also impact on their dividend payout. Uh, thank you so much, Ambrose Modian, Chief Research Officer, Invest Data Consulting, for sharing that, you know, expose our insights, because it's more like investors need to know where to position in this time where Forex seems to be very scarce. Thank you so much exactly. for that. Thank you so much. Thanks for having so me. So you see yeah. now what Ambrose is saying, that we should know where to position, not just stay, you know, fixed Keep in the position, to the ground. ground, and, you know, know and where you know, to another, stay. And, you know, another case around the market mm. is the FBN holding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's a group of shareholders who want the AGM to hold. And There's a group, a group that does not want it. The matter is in court, and it seems the AGM is holding. So we'll see how that, that plays out and how it affects, you know, investor sentiments. Really. Exactly. Thank you. We'll <laughs> see you at 1:30. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to the UK now. And uh, a bit of good news, but uh, Juliana always has a way of balancing whatever we see as good news. Juliana, good morning. We see that the UK wages uh, grew at a record rate. Uh, is this a response uh, or benefit of those industrial action we've always been talking about? Good morning, Innie. I think so, slightly. Um, we have had the data, as you quite rightly said, from the Office for National Statistics this morning, giving us a forensic look at the UK's labour market data. Very important data, of course, because um, the, the, the labour market is incredibly crucial to economic activity in the UK. Now, the headline figure is looking at unemployment, which has jumped up slightly to 4.2% in the month of June from 4%. Um, as I I was saying to you yesterday, historically and internationally, this unemployment data is pretty low. So it does go to show that most people in this country are working. But if you scratch beneath the surface and you start having a look at wages, this is uh, possibly um, of a huge concern to the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey. What this data has shown is that in the month of June, if you are working in the private sector and you're fortunate, you may have seen your wages rise to about 8.2%. Now, this is much higher than economists had forecast at about 7.8%. Um, and this is an issue because if we look at the inflation data we received uh, for that month, it was about 7.9%. So for the first time uh, since we've come out of this pandemic, wages are rising faster than inflation. So as you said, this is good news. Good news in the short term for um, employers and staff. So that means, of course, at the weekend uh, or at the end of the month, you've got more money in your pocket, which means you can buy more items. The bad thing is, um, and this is what we've heard from the Bank of England, as well as the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, is that a significant rise in wages does push up inflation. Um, so unfortunately, um, after receiving this data this morning, I think economists are predicting that the Bank of England will maintain its hawkish stance on interest rates currently at 5.25% when the Monetary Policy Committee meet in three Needle Street next month. They're expecting it to be hiked up to about 5.5 percent. What a life, Juliana. Just when you are about to, uh, you know, throw your hair and say, yes, I have more money in my pocket, and then the threat of inflation dampens, dampens that. Yes. But uh, another good news seems to be the grocery yes. price. Uh, it's down for a fifth week. And now that you're saying that uh, perhaps with more money, inflation might come up again, it's a threat to this. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. We have had uh, some further data from Canter, which is uh, some sort of intelligence um, agency that does look at food prices and shopping bills. And they have revealed that, yeah, again, um, w w prices in supermarkets are falling, I believe, for the four months to the 6th of August. Uh, food price inflation was at about 12.7%. This is one of the sharpest falls that they've seen month for month 
in a couple of years. So I think on the surface, of course, consumers are relieved that they're going into uh, supermarkets and they're not spending as much as they were on basic items such as milk and olive oil. They've been cited in the Cantor survey as being one of the fastest fallers for groceries. However, it is still expensive. Um, whatever a family shop is, your weekly family shop this week is certainly going to be much higher than it was this time last year. But it is good news and it does start to show uh, that some of those, um, uh, you know, those mullings, those batterings that supermarket bosses received a couple of weeks ago at the um, select committee and from uh, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, who actually had um, some sort of mini summit with supermarket bosses to try and get them uh, to bring down the prices. prices. It's working. Prices are coming down. Uh, so, yeah, some, some good news here that you, you have more money in your back pocket and more money to spend in shopping. But as we said about that interest rate rise, if you are somebody with significant amounts of debt in this country, unfortunately, those, um, uh, those monthly payments are going to increase as uh, the Bank of England um, maintain their hawkish stance. Yeah, thank you so much, Juliana. We do need some of those uh, interventions back here in Nigeria also. But thank you. Yeah. We'll talk to you at 1.30. Yes. Talk to you then. Thank you. All right, let's move to the crypto space now and see what the color is. There you have it. It's not good, not looking good at all with a lot of red there. Uh, Bitcoin, the king of crypto, still struggling, really struggling at this 29. I don't know what we're going to do to push it. Just push it up, you know. <laughs> and get, it's down 0.19%. The dominance is back at 48%. Everybody's hit in the crypto. Every coin is hit. So, uh, of course, you expect the crypto to still the Bitcoin to be the major one. Uh, um, Ethereum is down almost half a percent, 0 0.42 at 1,841.28. Let's see the fear index, the fear greed index. There you go. It's still neutral. It seems like a boring market these days. I've been neutral for every day. <laughs> at 53, it's looking a bit better than yesterday, just one or two points higher, but it's still within the neutral zone. So we need a push in this market. We need something to spoil this market. Let's look at the other prices there. We've seen that. We've seen that. BNB 0.61% down. Uh, Cardano is down. XMP has just managed, you know, to stay up 0.05% at uh, about 62 cents there. Let's find out if there's something we can do to bring some life into this crypto market with success. Uh, Chibuike founder, BC Crypto. Uh, hi, success. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. Good to have you, success. So we've seen the market in the neutral zone for about a week consecutively, and that's so boring. What do you think can bring some life into the crypto space? Okay, uh, like you said, the market has been stagnant for a while. Uh, I haven't reached the, the benchmark from May last year. That's 30,000. The last time I was here, I spoke about uh, the 30,000 benchmark. So moving forward, I think uh, to move the to move the markets for the some events I'm looking at. Okay, seems uh, success like, has some technical issues there. We can barely hear you. Success, can you hear me? Because I, I can barely hear you. Okay, um, I, I don't think we can do that. Perhaps. Perhaps we'll have to do success tomorrow. All right, we will have to do success tomorrow. Success, if you can. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay, so we'll have to do success tomorrow. Uh, the network is not friendly at all. I can barely hear what you're saying, so it's not be fair on our viewers. So success, we'll talk to you tomorrow, God willing. Uh, but for now, let's see some more about the prize action. There you have uh, the top gainers. Uh, not the usual suspect. Uh, I think the one that is most common here is the Solana at 2.42%. Uh, FXS is up also. But look at the impressive run uh, here. More than 12% in the positive. And Haba also more than 16% in the positive. If you had something here, this might be a good time to cash out. But that will only bleed the market even more. Let's see the top losers at this time. Um, there you have it. XDC. Uh, ING and uh, you know all of that 
Well, let's, looking at the numbers, at least we don't have uh, double digits in the negative. That's a little bit of hope uh, right there. But uh, it's not a very interesting market for now, maybe for someone like me. <laughs> But I know there are people out there, you know, those crypto investors who are really interested and passionate about it, especially some of our analysts here. They are working to bring life to the crypto market. Perhaps they can do that overnight, and tomorrow we'll have a, a better market to report. But that's it uh, for the crypto space and business morning for today, Tuesday, the 15th of August. It's another one tomorrow, and we will have another 55 minutes of uh, current and relevant business conversation that will add value to you, to your decision making and all of that. So I'll see you at 10 p.m. for the stock market report. Uh, perhaps the bear, the bull will be back today. The bear has had its hold on us for some days. Now, Will Ibong will be here at 1.30 to give you an update from the world of business. From me, go out there and make some money. I'll see you tonight.